All right, Christopher here. Welcome to Do Explain. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my current supporters who inspire me to carry on with this project and make it financially viable as well. I'm very grateful to all of you. Big hugs. And while I'm not in the business of telling people what to do, I can share my vision for Do Explain going forward. I like to work on the podcast full time instead of just a few days a month. I want to build a real platform for the fun and friendly exchange of interesting ideas. And I want to do it ad free if possible because I don't want any ideas to be off limits for us to explore. And I also want to keep saying dumb shit without repercussions. But to do this, I'll need a steady income, and that's why I need your help. So if you enjoy what I'm doing here, and you want to join me in my vision and become a part of growing this project, consider going over to patreon.com slash doexplain and sign up to become a monthly supporter. All right, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this episode. In what way, if at all, it it bears upon your stuff and in some way we've been carrying on that inquiry in the <laughs> background for these lo these many years so uh, but but the truth one seems to be the the, mo- the easiest way to concentrate that that question I guess yes and we uh, we really enjoyed your latest appearance with the increment boys Vaden and Ben oh yeah uh, that was fun yes and you touched on this particular topic there and uh, so yeah, we thought we would uh, we would give it a shot as well. We I, I think we might disagree uh, with you a little more than they do. I think we take a stronger stronger stance there, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, the, tr- the truth is, I feel like I don't totally I don't totally know, um, but because because in some way, like the they're coming from different, um, like the the inputs into this are coming from like very different lineages that don't tend to talk to each other, and so we're trying to see if they they interact or not, but. Okay, so may- maybe the best place to start is this truth talk, which I know is not was sort of just a you're trying to figure yeah. out this question <laughs> uh, rather than like you know your your deepest commitment. So I'm not I'm not holding them to you, uh, it, holding you to it as your deepest commitment, but it was interesting in the sense that it kind of like yeah it, it crystallized some some of these questions for me. So what I what I understood you to be saying in that truth talk is that. Um, you're trying to figure out this this question of how you can retain objectivity given the inevitable ambiguity of any statements we speak or yes. think. Um, and uh, the, the, the ambiguity there is an ambiguity of natural language that can't be escaped by natural language. And so rather than having a direct reference relation between the statements and the world, you have a reference relation by way of propositions, which can be perfectly precise and perfectly unambiguous and so forth, such that they can correspond in this, I guess, like Tarski sense yes. to the world, uh, which is, uh, it, you got into this a little bit with Faden and Ben, but like ambiguous is not quite the right word for, la- for, for the world, but something like uh, ontologically definite in the sense that it, 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 it can be characterized with um, precision or something like that. Uh... Yeah, um, the 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 world ambiguous is is a kind of a category error when it comes to the world because ambiguous refers to statements or propositions or 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 something like that something which asserts something but the world doesn't assert something right. it just is there and we can get it more or less right. Right. <clears throat> um, but, but, um, the world can't be, uh, well, I got, I mean, so, so there's this term nebulous that, that, for example, this guy, David Chapman uses, that's sort of like the world level uh, word for ambiguous, which is like, um, not precisely characterizable, something like that. Um, well, um, and, nebulous means cloud-like and, uh, right, right. a cloud um, may not be precisely measurable or, or whatever, but the cloud is there and the cloud is either one way or another way, whether or not we can know it or measure it. So I don't think right. that makes the world 
well, the world is cloud-like, <laughs> but it's not nebulous <laughs> in the sense of ambiguous-like. Mm. Right. Okay. So, so th th in some way, we're like uh, we're getting close to the heart of the matter sooner than I would have expected. But there's a there's <laughs> before a your slides that gets made. Yeah. 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 I'll, 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 I can I can pull up the slides in a minute, but. Um, the distinction that I think I make that uh, I don't think Popper makes and that like is not c commonly made in the rationalist tradition in general between how the world is altogether and how it gets characterized in terms of objects, categories, properties, relationships, which I put under the bucket of like ontology. So often ontology is just how the world is altogether, but I'm using that to refer to the world as parsed into right objects, good distinction um, yes yeah. so uh, what you mean by ontology is maybe what someone else might mean by the theory of ontology or the true theory of ontology or something like that or well uh, that's the that's the ambiguities right so um, there are some kinds of ontologies ways of parsing the world that are clearly not wholly context and purpose uh, independent and, and, and uh, objective in that sense. Like what counts as a cup when I'm just, you know, like r a rough and ready cup that I need to swig something might not be some way of characterizing the world that's perfectly objective and, and suitable for a scientific theory. Right. So, you know, a tree stump counts as a chair in certain contexts and not in others or something like that. Yes, but also what you said earlier is even even deeper, that um, the way in which we slice the world up conceptually is it doesn't match the way the world is objectively sliced up. So we may think of a, a thing like um, a correspondence between two things, like um, mm -hmm. the, 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 the someone's made to measure suit may correspond to their shape, but that may <laughs> not be the best way of looking at it. The best way of looking at it, it might be in terms of symbols of class uh, allegiance, uh, whatever. Yeah, you know, I'm just I'm just making it up mm. as I go along. But. I, right, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so. Um, in that sense, an ontology wouldn't be what you're saying, what you're calling the, the true theory of ontology in this objective sense yes. of true. Okay. There's, a, there's an analogy between that distinction and this, dis, in my mind, bet, and this distinction you're making between statements and propositions. Because the meaning of a natural language statement is uh, relative to the interpretation of words within a particular linguistic community, which if you take the sort of full later Wittgenstein line on it is like meaning is is often use. And there's nothing intrinsic about DOG that makes it refer, but rather by convention, learning a language within a particular linguistic community. I, I learned that dog means dog. Yes, you know? by the way, um, the same is true of formal languages as used in mathematics. Well, but to, th th this is what I, um, if, if, if the only way that words get their meaning in natural language is by learning their use within a particular linguistic community, I don't know by what causal, and, and that, that has, there's a causal story you can tell there, like almost like a physical causal story um, you can tell there about the manner in which the terms get their meaning. Um, because it, it ultimately cashes out in the interactions that I concretely have rather than something intrinsic to the symbols. Um, yeah. That you can, there's a story that you can tell there that you can't ever tell about perfectly abstract propositions. Um, like, I don't know how they get their meaning um, apart from by their use. Well, example. wait. <laughs> uh, so propositions propositions aren't ever known to anybody and they don't get their meaning They're, they they are abstractions of of sort of um infinitely precise statements but n nobody uh, so that they, they don't have to get their meaning from any I, I mean, they can't get their meaning from anything 
um, statements get their meaning, as you say, from um, uh, from culture. But uh, I, I want to avoid, just in case we're going there, <laughs> I want to avoid any <laughs> trace of inductivism here. Uh, it's not like Wittgenstein thinks that we we hear the word dog a lot and then we associate it with a dog. The the connection um, between um, a statement and and an object, or a word and an object, is always conjectured. So uh, I, I may I may conjecture um, that a dog is a useful concept, and I may conjecture something in the world that corresponds to dog, to to the word dog. Mm-hmm. Um, but that conjecture may be false, and I may correct it. And there is such a thing as correcting it. I, I can say uh, my previous um, uh, meaning that I assigned to to the word dog um, is wrong. And people use this. This happens when to everybody, um, alas, when they talk about fish, and at some point they're told that the whale is not a fish. <laughs> um, and I, I right, think that's right. um, that's an appeal to authority. Um, a whale is a fish in the in the um, <laughs> everyday sense of the word. Yeah. And right. uh, we should not acquiesce in giving over everyday meanings of words to scientists who have define them according to the meaning that they have for scientists. And so, um, yeah, sorry, but that, I mean, that may be a sidetrack. No, no, that's, no, no, that all that, all that's very helpful. I, I don't think I was going to go in an inductivist direction, but you, you tell me, but what, what you said is just, I, I definitely agree with, and it's interesting, so, but when I think about, um, truth or falsity with respect to whether a whale counts as a fish, for example, the, the, the type of truth or falsity that gets used in rational, objective, scientific theories doesn't seem to be the relevant one. And, and the, the reason I mean that is because like whether it's true or like, true or false seems like also like a category error a little bit there it, in that it's not trying to parse the world as the world is already so parsed on its own side, independent of our context and purpose. Yes. Um, and um so, so in that sense, it's not objective in the sense of being wholly on, on that side. Do you see, you see yes, it? Yes, although side. it is objective in the sense that one can meaningfully say that one has made a mistake in... in w- within a particular context, like for particular... Yes, you, but, you, but like, just uh, now I was, yeah. I was not only doing that. I was saying that a particular context is the right one to use and people often use the wrong context. Uh, and it, and it, it, it could um, be that, that our, our culture switches over to this scientific uh, use of the word fish, and I would still object to it. I mean, whether I'm right or wrong is neither here nor there, but it's meaningful for mm-hmm. me to object to that change in usage and say that the old usage was better. Uh for particular purpose, like I keep wanting to sort of do this re-relativizing move. Yeah. Not, not okay. To, for like, particular make purpose, endless but, relativism. but uh, yeah, yeah. Again, uh, it's not necessarily a pre-existing purpose. You know, th- this. Sure. Yeah. The purpose yes. can change, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I think I totally agree with everything you just said, but then, um, is there a way in which? Uh, and does all this fall under the bucket of, of what you would call parochialism generally? Like when I talk about context and purposes, is that um, is that included in what you tend to mean by parochial or no? Um, well, when I say parochial, um, I mean something which um, is is a, a narrow view of a, of a particular thing, which in my book I use it mostly pejoratively because the book mm-hmm. is about the largest possible uh, scale of things and the, the right, most universal. Right, yeah. but, but if, I, if, I, yeah. if, if the book was about something else, then parochial wouldn't necessarily be um, a, a pejorative term. Um, so, mm-hmm. uh, like, if I were 
reviewing a, a biology textbook or something, I wouldn't object to them saying that that that, that um, a whale right. is not all a fish. adaptations are parochial and and not the worst for it or something like that. Like, uh, yeah, I mean many. it. Um, Parochial isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's 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 only a bad thing if you're reaching for for something universal. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are propositions in this? Uh, uh, I, I, and I guess it's for you to talk because they're abstractions. But but I'm sort of using this reality of abstractions thing in the back of my mind, where there's nothing there's nothing that's like. Uh, it's also not a diminutive to call something an ab a mere mm -hmm. abstraction in 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 your world. So. <laughs> Are propositions necessarily not parochial in their meaning or reference? You see yes, what I'm so I suppose a, a proposition would come along with a uh, with a um, with a context built in, so so that mm. um, that I, I could idealize the concept of fish in biology and I could idealize the concept of fish in everyday language. And each of mm. those would correspond to some, uh, well, there would be propositions that use those concepts or that use those nouns. Mm. And, uh, mm. and they would be different. They would be applying to different things. And the, the difference and the precise specification of what the context is would be would be part of the proposition. Okay. Okay. So, in some sense, the 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 context all gets loaded into that. Yes. Uh, a, a, as a further idealization. Or, yes. Or, or, so or, I suppose yeah. mathematicians do this all the time because they 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 say um, uh, there are there are three um, the, the the number is three. Um, as a natural number, but you know there are three solutions or something. Uh, but but if we were interested in integers, then there might be more solutions. And if if there if we were interested in something else, then there might be no solutions at all. Um, hmm. So uh, when a mathematician says three, implicitly, he's referring to some context in which three is a, a, a member of a set that um, mm -hmm. the, the mathematician happens to be interested in for these present purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a very good okay. example, but uh, I could probably think of better examples. Well, no, but it, it's still interesting because as you're saying, it's like, it's like uh, we have an image. I had an image of math as, as being conducted sort of decentrally as these perfect abstractions, but you're saying even mathematicians are importing some notion of context when they're... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, so even mathematics imports this this kind of context, but but in math you can make, uh, and I could get this totally wrong. So just, just let me know. But but I'm thinking of you know the 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 sets, which is something like the ontology being referred to in my, in our in this prior use of ontology can be made yeah. perfectly definite, perfectly precise, and. It's sort of all on the world side in 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 that in that language. You see, what I'm saying like this. Well, when you say it can be made, can't be made by humans. No, there no. is such a thing as a perfectly precise characterization. I've just thought of a better example than integers, sets. So uh, um, a mathematician might say, um, so and so, uh, this collection uh, is not a set um, under. ZF set theory, mm -hmm. but under an expanded set theory, it is a set. Mm. But usually, one doesn't say which set theory one sets uh, belong to um, if it's if that's not part of the problem one is addressing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of everyday everyday mathematics language being imprecise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, there's something that I I at least think characterizes mathematics though that i don't think characterizes at least most of our uh interaction with the world which is something like this this idealized sense of correspondence where you have all the symbols on one side and the world on another side the world comes already so parsed 
independent of any kind of purpose. And then, and then like the point is to get the, the symbols on this side to mirror the world on this side. And that, that, that idea of correspondence, if you want, or like representation was imported into the rationalist tradition in philosophy, because you're trying to sort of do this formal logic to mirror how the world is on its own side. But the more you bring in this context and what I'm calling like a context and purpose relative conception of ontology, the more that seems like a little bit problematic in the sense that like the it doesn't really make sense to say the world already is divided into sets in that sense, because what counts as a particular object will depend on things on your side, not just on the world side. Yeah, but for every, if we're talking about propositions, mm -hmm. um, for every characterization of the world in terms of slicing up of the world in terms of concepts, mm -hmm. there is a proposition which includes a specification of that slicing up, which specifies not only how how that was sliced up, but ab about what it actually is like uh, after after it's been sliced up. Mm, okay, okay. So, but but then um, what what is what is yeah. what does reference even mean in that case? Because um, like reference in the human case, in in some way it will cashes out to like how it causes me to comport myself in some way it cashes out in like action, like how it causes me to behave toward the world. And that that's sort of in this idea of meaning as use, like it's what I do uh, that, that, that constitutes the thing's meaning, the, the way it gets me to, to behave toward the world. But I don't know what that would mean. I don't, I don't even know what meaning means in the case of a proposition in that sense. Um. So the reason why I want it, the reason why I want that to be there, and, and the reason why uh, I think it's unsatisfactory just to use the Tarski's theory of truth um, directly from utterances to physical objects mm -hmm. is that um, truth is an all or nothing thing. It's uh, the the uh, there's the law of the excluded middle, you know. There in logic, there is, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but if we want to use that concept mm. in real life, in in ordinary speech, there has to be a sense in which ordinary speech corresponds to something that does have the law of the excluded middle. Right, right, right. Statements don't, but if we can if we can make sense of saying. Yeah, but statements are an approximation to a thing that does have the law of excluded middle. And therefore, if someone says to me, no, the, uh, you know, the law of the excluded middle isn't true because something can be both true and false at the same time, like can be true in one universe and false in another, mm. then I can say, yeah, but you're, you're not using that. I can point to, to the way that they're not using it um, uh, properly in the sense of make that they're, they're not trying to make a statement that corresponds to a proposition mm -hmm. they're trying to redefine what it means to be true and that's that's you know that's the relationship between propositions and the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that re really has that and all we can have is approximations to that i don't know if that's that, I, I think i think i think it makes sense so so um if you can't appeal to the propositions then you can't appeal to anything objective when you're saying to uh like this yes. is true like really it's true yes <laughs> yeah yeah um that 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 isn't a problem for mo for most purposes right like i'm like from from you know if you and i have a misunderstanding uh that the example that gets used um that that uh, david chapman takes his um do, do, have you heard of the book understanding computers and cognition by Win Winograd and Flores. It's, I think it's referenced oh. in Gödel Escher Bach and Winograd is one mm. of the characters. Um, it's, it's one of the names that gets anagrammed in Gödel Escher Bach in one of the dialogues that's very much like oh, your I've book. I've forgotten that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but so uh, uh, Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores wrote a book called Understanding Computers and Cognition. And there's an example that they use in it that's, that's very influential where it's like, if I say to you, is there any water in the refrigerator? 
and you say yes and then i go and look and there's nothing in the refrigerator there's just an eggplant in there and something else and they you you go you lied to me and i go no i didn't you know there's water in the cells of the eggplant right okay so that would be like a uh (laughs) in some sense true in some sense false but you and i had a misunderstanding about meanings there where what I was referring yeah. to when I asked the question, is there water in the refrigerator, is different than what you were referring to when you answered it. Yes. And and then we would work that out if that misunderstanding arose in that context. Like Exactly. Yeah. We would we would get closer and closer uh, until uh, we were close enough to for for misunderstanding not to dominate what, what we think each other are saying. Right. It, but is truth but the we thing? We wouldn't be perfectly close ever. But, but is truth the thing that we'd be deferring to in, neg- in negotiation there? Well, we'd, we'd, we'd usually, what we're really doing is we're, we're um, approaching each other. We're, we're, we're approaching, we're uh, correcting errors in our conception of each other. Right, right. But when people. Um, uh, get closer to each other in that sense, um, then the reason that they ha- have been able to do that is that they are also both getting closer to the truth. But but isn't part of the claim here that you want to make, Jake, that the, the truth of that statement, is there water in the refrigerator, is by definition dependent on your purposes as the asker? Or, or um, it, I think it's definitely dependent on your meaning as the asker, and then that's dependent on your purposes. And it doesn't sound like David actually disagrees with me. Um, no. So, yeah. so did I get you right, David? That that the on your view uh, in a case like that, that whole context um, is embedded in the abstract proposition itself. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm. And by the way, it's also embedded in real life in people's brains mm. because. Um, I have a theory about what context you're using and vice versa. You have a theory about what context I'm using. And we, in, we start off with mistaken theories about each other's intention, each other's context. Mm-hmm. And we correct those. As I said, what's kind of literally happening physically is that we're, we're correcting errors in our theories of each other. Right. Right. And, uh, and you could, you could uh, even say we're coming that, to share each other's context to a greater and purpose to a greater no, degree. Not necessarily. So long as I know what your context is, I don't have to share it. Uh, uh, um, yeah. I guess like um, I'm coming to rep. Yeah. To represent your context or like coming. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not in a literal sense, but yeah. you know, yeah. 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 But note that, I mean, I don't know where you're going with this again, but, but note that there are people who would deny all this. There are people who say things like, well, there's your truth and my truth, and there's no such thing as an objective uh, fact of the matter with the, that we can come to agree on. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you're the wrong social class or the wrong color or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, 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 um, I think if, I, if, if, if you're here and they're here, I'm like here. Which is to say, I'm I'm much closer to you than to that. But but um, there's a sense in which you're closer to that than a really naive rationalist view, right? Where it like, where it's just there's there's no there's no such thing as parochialism. It's just you know perfect perfect truth all the way down. And, and so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and there's a sense yeah. in which Popper was closer to that just by negating the certainty project that had characterized. Yes. Yeah. So yes, and that's why some people think that Popper is a postmodernist or that Popper caused postmodernism. Right. Uh, I, 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 um, there's a way in which this line of ink, like the way that Descartes, I think, set up the, the epistemological project as being build your knowledge on a foundation of perfect certainty, that mm-hmm. the failure of that did cause postmodernism in a certain sense, you could, you could argue. But Classic. you can't blame yes. Popper for pointing, that that was, uh, pointing out that that was misconceived. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not trying to take you all the way into full postmodern relativism, but I'm, I'm trying to give the devil <laughs> their, their fullest due in some, in some way. Um, and I think one thing that, that's at, at least, yeah, it seems right to me is that um, what, what I was talking about is ontology. Uh, so so the, the furnishings of the world um, in terms of objects, categories, properties, relationships, 
is not pre-given in the world, but dependent on our context and purposes. And when we able to, we're, we're able to successfully pick out the same ontologies in the world, as in the case of the you know water in the refrigerator example, it's because we're coordinating with one another, uh, not coordinating with the God's eye view. And you can yes. idealize the convergence there, but you can't idealize the convergence there for every possible situation, and you, nor would you want to. Well, there is some structure in the world, though. Um, mm-hmm. there, there, I mean, I, I would guess that the number three is not in the same category as, as uh, a dog. Um, that is, the difference between them is objectively... Or exists objectively, sorry, not just the difference between them. The fact that they are of different kinds, mm-hmm. one of them an abstract integer and the other one a a physical mammal, mm. um, uh, I think that exists in the objective world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not just, it's not just that I, I've sliced up the world in such a way that three is in a different category from dog. Um, I have, by doing that, by the fact that I have done that is partly due to the um, to the structure in the actual physical world and and the abstract world. Yes, ah, yes, yeah. yeah. So, but, so um, the way I'd want to put it is something like um, it's not arbitrary. Uh, yeah, how how we do the dividing for any given context and purpose. The in some way, the world is always pushing back, except when you're doing yes. mere invention. And and the world can be the abstract world. The world can be the physical world, and, and so forth. Um, but yes. but the like the way it matters that the world like th- there there are there are purposes for which it makes sense to bunch, you know, the integer three and dog into the same category and so forth. Like that that. And um, there's an if everything is routed by way of propositions and the paradigmatic case of what knowledge is, is taken to be this this idealization of perfect convergence on the objective truth. I, th- I think that's not quite right, because in, in some way, it's always coming from the bottom up and you're never hitting that. So it's sort of weird to make that the, the paradigm case. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Maybe that, maybe that was a... uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it's just because something's unattainable, um, that doesn't mean it's not meaningful or useful to speak of it. Well, but it, um, it, it, it might. Uh, so there's there's another uh, another distinction. So like a lot of a lot of what I would be talking about would get chalked up to epistemological uncertainty in in the Popper framing and in, in your framing, which is that we don't know. We may not. We may be uncertain. No, about, but but here we're talking about ontology, not epistemology. Right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 that that seems different than saying we just don't know yet, and that's why we can't attain it. Rather, like mm. what it would mean to attain it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to say what it would mean to attain it because it's always going to be well, it, for particular purposes. And, um, it's like uh, we might be able to attain anything up to that, but not actually that. Mm. Um, so, uh, like absolute zero, you know, we, we, we can speak of absolute zero and it can appear in equations and, and uh, so on, but absolute zero has never occurred in nature mm-hmm. and never will. So, uh, but it, 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 it's a meaningful thing to, to speak about. Mm. Is is the most? I mean, in some way, you, you said earlier that parochialism is not a denigration, uh, except when you're aiming at universality. Mm-hmm. Doesn't this imply that you're always sort of should be aiming at universality? You know, if that's well, the trouble mm. is that um, <laughs> uh, we're not in charge of where our our creativity leads. Mm-hmm. Um, we we may want to have a universal theory of um, of uh, disease, mm. but we might end up with a theory of canals instead. 
because that, that's where it led. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, um, uh, people often don't find what they're looking for, mm. and people often do find what they're not looking for. Is is the world amenable to? Do you think of the world as being amenable to universal description in any domain? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think so, mm. because otherwise you'd be saying that there's a limit to how well we can understand things. Like if there's a limit to how well we can understand dogs, it must mean that the domain of dogs is finite. And therefore it's, it's a subset of something wider that we could understand, so that we're, of which we could get a better understanding. Mm. Um. I think I don't understand. I, I, the, part of the reason I ask is like, um, <laughs> if, if I'm trying, to, if, if I if I take it back into the realm of like natural language and this these sort of more parochial things, um, you're sort of you're doing this coordination dance between your whatever your you know symbols are on the one side and the world on the other side, but you know the world is unstable at certain levels of analysis, and so like, um, you that that coordination thing is always kind of a dance it's not like a static thing that you could get right once once and for all um yes and the the that's part of why i think of the world as not being characterizable in like par partly just because of change but also because of this ontological nebulosity thing i don't think of it as being characterizable like the laws of physics are the sort of paradigm case of it's going to obtain for all of time and and so and so forth, you know so so to speak like um and so in that in that sense oh. that's but i don't think of everything yeah, as being I, like that um so i don't think even the laws of physics are like that uh, the, they they um there there is a certain like i i say when talking about constructor theory there is a prevailing conception of what constitutes a law of physics and it, that that conception has got a structure in it, it like the, it, it's it's a law of motion, and it mm. it has it has uh, entities which change with time and and that kind of thing. And and um, constructor theory proposes a different conception, and we don't know. I mean, we're trying to uh, express each in, in terms of the other and so on, but but the idea is that they won't be perfectly expressible mm. in terms of each other. Um, so one of them will turn out to be not useful, not 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 a good way to express the actual laws. So and and the biologist that first thought of the idea that a whale is not a fish uh, will will have been doing something like that. Uh, you know, the, they they will have been uh, when they wrote their grant proposal, they will have said. I shall be studying a certain type of large fish, and and uh, <laughs> later they will thought oh, <laughs> it, 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 oh. that that you know makes everything I'm going to say so absurd, and and uh, you know that we we have to change the terminology because the terminology is simply too misleading. It doesn't correspond to reality. Mm. So um, uh, that has happened with physics several times in history. Um, Kepler, you know, his laws were about the shapes of of um, orbits mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, about how uh, uh, and about the times that it takes for objects to go around the orbits, and there was no concept of force yeah. at the time. Yeah. Newton had to invent that. Yeah. And I think it didn't have some uh, kind of like occult sources or something like that. Like, wasn't there some, I've read accounts that it's like, you know, <laughs> the idea of the force he was importing from some of his weird al alchemical preoccupations or something like that. He, he might've been, yeah. but, but uh, I know he didn't like it. Mm. He, 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 he didn't like it because you can't see a force. Mm -hmm. You can't. Um, mm. So um, that's why he, he suppressed his own theory about the orbit of the moon um uh, and so on so it it uh, yeah uh, he might well have got it from from somewhere again you know where you get it from whether you like it or not whether you don't you know don't like it that your your research is going to take you in a certain direction you can either go in that direction and and make progress or you can just insist and not make not make any progress yeah 
Yeah. Uh, okay, I have I have maybe two two more. Qu- this has been super informative, so so thank you. Um, I have maybe two more like lines of questioning. One is a, okay. So one is about this analogy to to natural selection. That, that's one of the things that's so interesting about Popper is that you can really like be like, oh look, contextualism and criticism is very much like variation and selection. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but one of the first things that I remember being taught when I was learning about natural selection is that you shouldn't do this sort of purely hierarchical conception of fitness as being like a, you know, everything was trying to just become a human, which is the peak of the fitness ladder. Uh, And, and you also shouldn't have the conception of final fitness because there's always this kind of red queen dynamic happening between you and the environment. And it's, it's not that kind of thing where you're going to be fit once and for all. Um, because mm-hmm. you're you're changing the environment, it's cha- and so forth. You know, it's it's a, it's a very dynamic thing. Yes, and I think of knowledge as being kind of similar in that sense. But that's the, that that's part of why I have this intuition that uh, these universalized idealizations are sort of like uh, missing the point or something. Like you know what I mean? Like they're, yeah, uh, right. So the uh, uh, nice point. Um, uh, it's the first time I've thought of this, but I, I guess you're right, to put it in my terms, that there is no analog of truth in evolution. Mm. The the It's wrong, as you just said, it's wrong to think of the process of evolution as maximizing something mm. and it globally i mean locally it maximizes something but but there's there's no ideal thing that it's heading towards there is no ideal goal